Good afternoon, folks. How you doing? Or good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are across the world. Um, my name is Ryan Garker from Pod 67. Um, we are here for a Celtic State of Mind quadruple treble charity weekender. We are raising money for four great charities this weekend. Uh, 12 hours across two days, raising money for Rock Talk, which you've just seen there, the Food Fact Friends Food Bank, Children's First, which is Scotland's national children's charity. My mate Gary works for them. He's a fundraiser. They do some great work across there as well. And help for the homeless as well. So the full details are on the a Celtic State of Mind Twitter account, including the GoFundMe pages. Links will be below here somewhere as well. Um, if you can give a little, I know times are tough for everybody, but a little goes a long way these days. Um, so I'll get into to our show. Thank you very much to the guys from the Huddle Breakdown beforehand. Um, like I said, we are Pod67. We do a weekly show just basically talking rubbish about Celtic, reviewing games, talking everything that's happening, the big talking points. Um, and I'm joined by my two trusty colleagues here. So we'll go round the table first. Scott Sutherland, how are you doing, Scott? Hi, I'm good, mate. Hi. Quite nervous for this, actually. I can teach in front of a classroom in front of 30 kids uh, every single day, but I put me in a podcast live with without editing, it's uh, quite nerve wracking but I good, got the haircut for the day, uh, usually we'd have a night out, obviously the boys, but we're on for a podcast, so obviously raising a lot of good money, and who knows, after it we might double our listeners for two to four. <laughs> exactly, exactly, um, and also joined by our other colleague, Mr Tony Doyle, alright Tony? Oh Tony's, Tony's got his, his thing on mute, you can tell the, you can unmute, tell your the mic. Uh, unmute your mic Tony. He's rubbish. He's absolutely rubbish. Anyway, we'll get back to Tony, Tony in a second, Scott, because he's having a he's having a bit of a howler, isn't he? There. I know you notice how uh, our podcast need to be edited a lot because of Tony. <laughs> <laughs> spot the spot the big one. Look at him. He just keeps going. No, we can't hear you, Tony. We cannot hear a word you're saying. Listen, Tony is a guy um, that is currently on his phone. It speaks volumes, to be fair, for this podcast. Tony's the guy currently on his phone because he lives in 1995 and doesn't have a, a laptop like the rest of us to, to do things normal. Um, so I can see Paul John is currently talking Tony through, uh, getting onto this. So I'll give a wee rundown of what we do. So we, we're on Twitter, at pod underscore 1967. You can get us on there, join in the conversation. We we put out a few polls every now and then. Um We'll kind of put out questions to the to the fans and see what they can they can come up with as well. Um, we're going to talk today about the Scottish Cup finals um, that we've had. So we're obviously going for the quadruple treble tomorrow, Scott. I see Tony's just dropped away there just now. Um, we're going for the quadruple treble tomorrow. So what we're going to do is go through the three that we've had um, already um, and the kind of the, the treble treble. Tony, can you hear us? Are you? No, I can't hear this. He's, he's having a howler. He's having an absolute howler. <laughs> um, oh, while, while he gets that sorted, mate, we'll, we'll, um, we'll talk about these games. We'll start. So, quadruple treble. Uh, we've obviously done we've done the treble treble. This is, I keep going to say last year. It's not last year, is it? It's, it's two seasons ago. That was this this quadruple treble would have been would have been in May this year, which would have been last season. Um, we'll start off with the first one, Scott. It was the invincible treble. Um, Brendan Rodgers was a manager at the time. It was one of these times we were going for... You know, people spoke about going invincible quite early on in the season because of how well we were playing. Um, we'd won, obviously, the, the, the League Cup and we were on to win the league. And we were just kind of... This one was coming up and it was almost kind of inevitable that we were going to win the treble treble. But as the time got nearer, I think the nerves started to take over for folk, didn't it? Uh, aye, because obviously aye, that season I remember it. Uh, I remember first when we start when we were in the stadium and when Brendan Rodgers was appointed pre match and uh, pre in 2016. And obviously everyone chanting his name and obviously what's happened to him now that he's a, he's a rat and we all know that. But uh, <laughs> I, was, I remember being, actually being at T in the park and just thinking, what if this doesn't work out? Like, what if he doesn't end up uh, working out? And obviously as the season progressed, it kind of it got better and better and we just kind of kept going on this run and then I remember two days before it being at the, the Lisbon thing for the 50 year anniversary at Hydro and that was a great night out but you still had the kind of nerves in the back of your head of that Aberdeen game like there's one game here to go left to do it uh, I remember actually working uh, in the morning that game which was probably good for me because I kind of managed to take my mind up off it <laughs> and uh, going, to the, going to the game with Tony boy uh, he actually made the train for once so he was he was reliable that time uh, and <laughs> 
Uh, we went there and I remember it just teeming down with rain, like absolutely pelting. And I didn't even have a jacket on, I been soaked through getting into the ground. And uh, uh, it was some sight just to see obviously 25,000 Celtic fans there. And But uh, yeah, there was that wasn't an enjoyable game actually, really. Uh, we'll come on to probably talk about the double trip, that was a bit more enjoyable to actually enjoy as a game. But that game was just uh, obviously fraught with nerves. What about yourself? I think, uh, see, I was I was different because when this game came around, um, I've told you, it's just all about tell everybody else. Um, we were, uh, you, you two were at the game. I was actually in Dublin at this, t- at this time. I was going to see uh, Guns N' Roses playing. Uh, um, I can't remember, it's Lane Castle, I think it was. Um, so I was across on in Dublin for this day and I was gutted you know I was gutted I wasn't going to make the game so I was with my mate who by chance is a Rangers fan we we went to a pub because we thought we'd get some time beforehand we can go watch most of the game and I'll try and get maybe the end of it on my phone because we had to get a bus up to, to Bursling Castle was so I'm on this um on this bus so we're in the pub obviously Aberdeen score he celebrates we score you know I, I celebrate back then we have to leave and I'm on this bus trying to watch this game and you've probably not been to the Slane Castle. It's pretty much a, a 40 minute bus journey away from Dublin. We get stuck in traffic in the middle of these fields. My signal was going on my phone. I never, you know, I was kept refreshing the page. I couldn't get it, couldn't get it. I think maybe about the kind of 18, probably 75th minute, I lost all signal. I had no connection to the game at all. I get absolutely nothing. I was getting it on. It was showing me like the last thing that I seen. On it, I'm thinking I'm not going to see the end of this until I get here, and I don't know what's going to happen. And I'm asking people on the bus, is to get a good signal? Nobody had it. Guns and Roses, it's off all I got, right? On this, <laughs> on this, this thing, right? So I'm like, anybody get a sell it game? But what? No. So I'm like, right, okay. So I kept trying, kept trying, kept trying. And then by chance, mate, I kid you not, my phone got a signal. I get 4G popped up in the corner. I hit the game, it came on my phone, and it, literally the first thing that I seen was Tom Rogic striking that ball with his right foot as it just went past Joe Lewis into the goal and Tom Rogic ran away in the pissing rain and I just went absolutely berserk on this bus. Like I say, fall like off, right? People looking at me, I'm like, yes! This guy came running down the stairs, right? It was a double-decker bus, right? He came sprinting down the stairs. I heard him running the length, came right down the stairs and he just stood at the bottom, looked at me and went, have we done it? And I was like, we've done it, mate, yes! <laughs> <laughs> two is we're on this bus jumping about nearly greeting at the fact we'd done it um it was it was tremendous you know it was, it was probably the, the next best memory i could have had from actually being there um i can hear background noise tony are you there can you hear us i have no idea there he is i'm a fucking luddite i'm so sorry like, <laughs> it, you, just do not go like <laughs> But we're here now, so like I was saying, hi, how you doing? Uh, welcome to the group. What's going on, guys? How you doing? Welcome to the group. It's like a Celtic Anonymous. Right. Round table we were just talking, Tony, about the, the three the three cup finals that we had. Uh, so we started off with the Invincible Treble. Scott's gave his, his view on it. I've gave my story as well. I, what was I your kind of view? I'm going to nip in. Sorry, I've still I've stole Tony's Tony's line there. I do that quite a lot to you, don't I, Tony? Sorry about that. Yeah, uh, <laughs> just kind of on, on the actual game itself. Like I remember it starting, and then Griffiths loses his man for the first goal, and Johnny Hayes obviously ended up signing for us, and he puts it in, and I'm thinking, oh no, like this two season was too good to be true. It's obviously come crashing down, and I think it summed up Celtic the way we reacted. I mean, it wasn't even a minute straight for kick off Armstrong. One each, but it was quite frantic. I thought the rest of the game, Aberdeen had a few chances towards the end of the first half. Uh, Scott Sinclair actually probably won his worst games in a Celtic jersey. He couldn't put the ball in the back of the net. I remember that. Boyata had a header for a corner. I even remember the one at the other end where Johnny Hayes uh, played the cutback for Kenny McLean. I think it was, and the ball was just behind him, and McGregor mm-hmm. gave the ball away. And when that didn't, that was- when they were running down, I thought this is going to be it. That didn't quite fall. And then the more and more, the more chances we had. Uh, and I think as you've obviously had your own memories of that Rogic goal. But yeah, I just remember it. Uh, I'm getting the ball and picking it up and thinking. I just had a feeling that this is it. I felt like the goal was starting to come. And then as he obviously puts it in, uh, I can just remember going absolutely crazy. Because me and Tony will probably talk about his, the story. I was trying to get tickets for the game and we ended up being separated. So I was away up in the gods at Hamden. Uh, and I remember that going in, I just remember bawling my eyes out, like in proper tears. And I wasn't there was twenty thousand dollars also in tears. It was just a, an amazing moment. 
What's funny you talk about the the kind of stress you had for the game. Obviously, I've just given you my Dublin story. I missed most of the second half, so I didn't have that stress. You know, all I had was a good memory right at the very end. I didn't have to sit through. I did need to sit through the last chance where Aberdeen nearly scored right at the very very end of the game to, to equalise when the ball got lofted forward. You oh, just I thought you, you just thought the story was getting wrong. Tony, what was your your memory of this game? Obviously, we, me and Scott have kind of covered the the performance. If you get anything for this game, it really stands out. You know, kind of moment wise. <laughs> See, Ross, see how you get into hand on itself? I just remember being absolutely soaked through. Every lady clothing I had was just fucking came out of two two hour washing machine. It was disgusting. Phone was knackered, wallet was knackered, I was knackered. But let's go to say we were sitting separate for the whole game. I remember being actually above the Aberdeen sort of fans at the sort of left corner of the stadium. I remember when that go in the Tom Rogic, the lightning strike hit, and honest to God, the guy next to me just grabbed me like a big massive bear hug like I wanted all my family to hug me all my life, and my dad, but they loved me that much, it's just what this guy loved me for that one minute in my life, but that was probably the most iconic goal I've ever seen in a Celtic top, like, that was the first treble I could really feel and appreciate after Martin O'Neill, and that day itself was just unbelievable, it was written in the gods. Scott, doing doing an invincible treble, actually doing a, a treble, um, which we've seen from Rangers this season, having their best chance at a treble in, in however many years, and it's, they, they couldn't do it. i seen an article, I think it was in Daily Record, somebody put an article out saying, you know, it, it just proves that winning a treble isn't as easy as Celtic made it look. This season in particular, we did make it look particularly easy to do a treble, didn't we? In fact, we went invincible. Oh yeah, it was just it was, out, it was outstanding. Like in I think the cup record that we ran on, uh, I think thirty five games or whatever the record was, and there hasn't actually been that many uh, moments of like of like nervousness in all those cup runs. We kind of went through quite a lot of them. There was none where we kind of came back from the total brink. Uh, with a few kind of last minute winners, mm-hmm. I remember doing bellies and that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, this game itself could just, have easily been five like, each. Watching the chances back today. I think had about four or five sitters that could have scored themselves as well. It was one of the most tense games in that middle season, except for possibly the one at uh, Fir Park against Motherwell. And also they were two and a half at half time, and I'm mm-hmm. looking at the team going, you just need to come back and win this. We can't four- keep you beating off Motherwell. Was that a 4-3 game, aye? 4-3, aye. aye. Was it 2 at half time they were playing? I think so, I think so, aye. Aye, it's, um, like we say, it's, it wasn't the most kind of stressful season as much as you would expect it to be, but I think because uh, the the state Rangers were in at this point, um, obviously we can talk about the games that we that we had as well. Oh, that's another question I was going to ask you actually beforehand, um, before we kind of move on to the the Motherwell game afterwards, because we'll try and kind of power through these. In the the nine seasons, boys, um, mm-hmm. that's because Tony threw me off. He's we disappeared in there. Um, <laughs> in the nine seasons, Welcome. Tony, I'll start with you. What would you say was Probably one of your highlights of the the nine in a row run. Nah, that's, that's, honestly, there's absolute thousands. And uh, uh, if you had to, if I had to pin you down and get one off you, what would you pick? Um, it'd need to be top of my head. Five one day, Ibrox losing his last minute goal. Well, not last minute, but the fifth goal. Mm. Um, even before that, the Kenny Miller goal. The fact the Celtic fans themselves cheered louder than the Rangers fans and the music came across the timeline, like, this is the best day ever. They're not celebrating, we're going to have a nut, ironically cheering. But, um, still, still cannot believe they played gold music for that. That's embarrassing, isn't it? It's hilarious. And the fact <laughs> that me and Scott as elves got on telly for uh, the second goal, I think it was, we got on telly for, so it was brilliant. But um, no, loose goal for me, that run when he gets the ball, it just slots the ball. Calmly passed uh, McGregor into it. Probably. And then just left his top or runs it and that stuff. Same donkey, whatever. Doesn't matter. <laughs> same one. Scott, I'll ask you the same question to you. If you had to pick a, a memory from the nine seasons, what would you go with? Uh, well, I, what I would say first of all is obviously we're talking about memories and this maybe feels like a bit of an end of the year, but they're yeah, breaking out of uh, Ismail Asoro. I mean, the biggest memory is going to be that guy coming into the team for the 10 narrow season. So I'll add that <laughs> in. But for nine narrow, uh, <laughs> I would be similar, similar to Tony, but I would say the following season uh, with the odds on Edward in the 3-2 game, we were also at that game again, probably pretty much exact same seats, weirdly, that we're in again, like right down in the first row, uh, row eight, Ibrox were where, I mean, great memories for being there, obviously they threw their, uh, their toys at the pram, uh, and Dave King stopped us kind of going back to the games, and obviously nobody can get to the games right now, hopefully that will come back at one stage, but being in that game at Ibrox, you never kind of know what it's like. See the feeling when when Rangers score, 
it's absolutely horrible that you see these three stands of them bouncing up and down and you could tell that they thought this was it this was their moment this was their chance to finally come back it is it was when especially went through each and yours got sent off and uh obviously we've had a drop off this season but i think and with the way rogers just changed his team around and yours got sent off brought that extra striker on uh put two up and then uh, Edward, when he just you just again similar to the Rogic one, just the way he cuts inside. I kind of thought he's this is he's going to do this. He's I remember looking exactly right behind it with Tony uh, when he put that ball, and it was just like an, an absolutely amazing feeling. And when you seen that game out, and that would be even better than the five one game for me because there's nothing quite like kind of going toe to toe with them and then thinking it's going to drift away for us, and then it didn't, and then we just plowed on for there and never really looked back. I think my best memory of that game, I was sitting in a pub full of old guys watching that game who didn't understand um, modern day betting. So I was waiting for one Celtic corner to win £75. It was just a wee request I bet I'd done. And I was waiting for one Celtic corner and it was maybe the 75th minute. I said to somebody like, what do you mean you're just waiting on one corner? So I'm explaining to all them, do you know when the corner came? 92nd minute. Like <laughs> we celebrated the corner, like more than we celebrated the goal, because everybody in the pub at this point knew that I was waiting for one corner for like seventy five quid or whatever it was. Like right, it's odd waiting for booking in the game, going, "Come on, so just get booked." I want to win twenty quid. <laughs> Do you know what it was? It was I, I think we had a shot, and I think it was fathering him or somebody saved it, and the ball was just trickling out, and Eddie was shielding it until it just right. trickled out for a corner, and we were all like, oh, watching this bogging it. And eventually, the whole pub went mental. Big um, man's one boy quid, yes! I know. Shots, oh, shots. Brilliant, mate. I was like, ah, three pints for me and nobody else. Um, <laughs> so, right, we, talk, we spoke about that then. I'd probably say my one of my highlights would have been the 5-0 game to win the league at, at Parkhead against Rangers. That would have been a, a particular highlight for me, just because of... Because I got to yeah. sixty minutes and you thought this is going to be an absolute blow. This could be easily ten in this game. Like and it could have been see if you go back and look at the chances that we had and the missed, you know, it could have easily been ten or eleven in this game. Um but we'll come back to the, the Scottish Cups boys. So we spoke about the Invincible Treble and the feeling that was of, of securing the Invincible Treble. We got into the next season, um, well the talk of, you know, we are the best team in the country, nobody's gonna even lay a glove on us this season. Um and Fast forward to end of the season, we're playing Motherwell, Scottish Cup final again, going for the double treble. Um, Tony, I'll start with you on this one. What was yep. your? Actually, no, I'm not because you kind of fought in your story a little bit. I'll start. Yeah. With, I'll start. I don't, with really Scott. Want, I don't really want to talk about my story too much. Is there? We'll, we'll get on to your PSA story. Stuff. Aye, as yeah, people have probably good. guessed, we we are sharing we are sharing stories. If you're just tuning in, just now, we are sharing our stories from these games because we can talk about the games in detail if we can. But everybody knows kind of knows how they went. We're kind of giving a wee bit of a, our day on this. So Scott, I'll, I'll start with you. We were we were together quite early for this one. Went for a wee bit to eat, uh, and then we went to a, a popular Irish bar in Glasgow for the the build up to this one. What do you remember for for the build up? I remember I, we went to Malone's before it and then it was St Vincent's after it showing us really off to be the Celtic Spice Boys here, aren't we, really? Going to the, going to the <laughs> pubs. But, uh, I remember it before it, getting a breakfast and then being in there for 11 o'clock queuing outside. I remember it. Sharp contrast the year before. It was a roasting hot day, man. Uh, 20, 25 degrees or whatever outside. Uh, Celtic talks on. It was kind of more of a upbeat mood. Or I mean, last I think there was less nerves, especially on my part, I think, going into this game. Obviously, there's Cup games end can happen, there's a wee doubt in the back of your mind, but kind of felt confident pre-match and then I drank the Malone's, I'll let Tony explain his story of the day, but I'll go for, for my story where we ended up just going to the game and uh, I've been, actual memories of the game are a bit hazy just because of the amount of, of bevy that was drank, but uh, this was really a good one to enjoy because McGregor's... Uh, Scott, Scott, it wasn't the bevy mate, it was the sun that done it to you, it was, it was uh, the sun stroke that you had that, that makes your memory hazy, it wasn't the, wasn't the bevy. I the McGregor's first goal, I mean, that's a really, really underrated goal. Uh, that first mm-hmm. one, the way he takes that. And then when Cham makes it 2-0 at, at 30 minutes, and then you could just enjoy it. I thought uh, the man of the match for me that day was actually was Moussa Dembele. He didn't score, but it's probably kind of the last real proper memory we've got of him. Obviously, he left following that summer, but I thought it, just, it was imperious. That day just bullied uh, the Motherwell defenders and... I just imagine just to enjoy that last 60 minutes uh, and then obviously the scenes afterwards that most people remember the 
of the of the open top bus, but uh, not for us because we decided obviously to just carry on our night and, and go straight to the pub, which maybe I regret looking back because uh, I don't know if we'll get to like the open top bus ever again. I missed it. Well, but. one person who does regret this, who wasn't with us during the day but met up with us later on, is Mr. Anthony Doyle, who's sitting just below me there on this screen. Um, Tori, we met you in St. Vincent's after this game. Um, right. and, then, and then you went, you went missing, well, you, mate. You met, you met a version of me in that pub. Definitely was me. I was actually man possessed in the bed all day. Um, the only memory I have of that game is, is literally being some instance. I don't remember a thing from the moment I woke up I had a fry up. It was two bottles of tonic in the way to town, both finished before I got to Brigton. <laughs> we get into town. <laughs> Straight to St. Vincent's, as you do, my shoes were just stuck to the floor in the one spot, so I didn't get to move much on it, which was quite good, because the carpet in there is notoriously sticky, but I digress. But the PTSD flashback for me that night was getting kicked out of St. Vincent's after dropping a whole tray of venoms on the floor. And for all the listeners, a venom in town is about £10 a go for a drink. There's about five in this tray. <laughs> and then I was getting kicked out of St. Vincent's, claiming Irish bigotry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, an Irish, an Irish pub. Yeah. F- from a Scottish guy, by the way. From a Scottish guy. Because <laughs> my name's Anthony Stephen Francis Doyle. I'm not taking that stuff. <laughs> but um, heading up to the town, thought, do you know what? I'll be a big boy. I'll get a wee lift up the road with my mum. She'll take me home, drop me off. Perfect. I got to the Mitchell Library. Next thing I know, I've woke up in the bottom of the steps at the library. <laughs> I've got back up to my knees at the scene in Shawshank Redemption. He's looking up at the bottom and getting in the rain. <laughs> my nose is gushing of blood. I've still got the scar to this day, actually. You can't even see it in the camera. God. But that was my memory that day. Double treble and a double concussion. <laughs> so, great day, great day. But, Scott, this uh, we, we mentioned that a minute ago. This game, um, obviously, kind of following what happens next year as well. Um, Carl McGregor, I think, said after the, the, the treble treble game that this one kind of goes a wee bit unnoticed because it's probably not as glamorous as the, the two that we've done. Um, and that treble run, obviously, first one being invincible, last one being a treble treble. It sounds better, you know, kind of aesthetically. But the the game itself, for being you know, kind of relatively underrated, I think you mentioned it yourself. It was it was a good performance phase in it. It's, it's one of these games that could have easily been a been a slip up. Aye, because Motherwell had a good season that uh, that year and they were doing well under Stephen Robinson, who's still. Still there now, but uh, yeah, I, it's you are right. It's a really underrated game because I think you are right. It just doesn't sound right. But the double treble is the first team uh, in Scotland to accomplish that achievement, so it was really huge, huge at the time. And it was just, uh, it was just the way it fell, just nicely to be kind of scored a two 0 up. And Motherwell, I don't really actually remember Kay Gordon actually really having a save to make. It was just really comfortable, and that was where you always felt more comfortable. I think we're, we're going to come on and preview the cup final quickly in maybe in the last 10, 15 minutes. But you felt we always felt more comfortable under Rodgers that there was a game plan and we were right in control of the game. And as soon as you go 2-0 up, you go, there, we're no, no way we're throwing that away. But it's Lennon now, it's a wee bit of a basketball game at times and it's, it's kind of a rush of blood. Like you don't really know what's going to happen uh, anytime we take the pitch. And even tomorrow, you've kind of got your doubts about whether we will win it. I think we will, but there's still edge. That game, you just feel confident, especially 2-0 up, and, and we just seen it out, and just a class team. And that was probably the moment within the... It's definitely within the Rodgers run that we peaked, and then, obviously, Peter Lowell went and ruined it all when uh, he refused to pay the money for John McGinn, and then it went totally downhill after that. I'm not even letting you get away with that one, because you just didn't want John McGinn. Apparently, I'm going out. You just were like, oh, I don't want John McGinn. We should be going for something better. Look at him now. Like, absolutely to be fine. fair... I didn't want John McGinn because he went to my school and it was just sheer jealousy that I was in right. myself. That's all it was. It was total jealousy for you. It was like, <laughs> if I can do it, they can do it. <laughs> uh, so, boys, that's us. We've done the, done the double treble then. We move on to the, the, the next season and you're thinking at the start of the season, can we do a treble treble? I'm thinking, out of them all, a treble treble is the one that I want because it sounds the best. You know, it just sounds... I hate people that were calling it triple trebles. It just didn't sound right. A treble treble is what we were going for. Um, we go through this season, <clears throat> got a bit of turmoil halfway through. Brendan Rogers decides to up sticks and leave. He's away to away to Leicester, and we bring in uh, Neil Lennon, whose first game back in charge of Celtic is away um, at Tannadice against Hearts. Uh, Scott, we watched this game this game together. Um, it was. Were you nervous? We'll talk about the, the Hearts game in the league first because it was almost like a, 
a monkey on Lennon's back at this point. So, like, first game in, he had to get this one over the line, didn't he? Aye. Go, I, I would more give John Kennedy. Uh, probably not a popular thing to say. Uh, the way you look at uh, Twitter and look at John Kennedy, people freezing their tellies to, to well, show him uh, well, that's, angry. That's 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 <laughs> uh, I would give a lot of credit to John Kennedy, actually, more so than Lennon for those two games, because Lennon just kind of came in last minute, and there's obviously this talk of Lennon coming in the stadium ship, and he probably was, he was definitely was the right man at that time, because there wasn't anybody really else, but he did come kind of come for an unemployed position, we went wrong at Hibs, but uh, I, that game, first game at, at Tynecast, so I kind of always had a feeling, I always get feelings before games, I know I keep saying that, but I had a feeling in this one that we were going to win, it was a sort of siege mentality, you've seen the fans, or didn't he actually get a ticket for that game, but it was at Easter Road three days later, when we won in the Cup, and there was sort of that siege mentality, of like, right, okay, he's left, us stuff him, we're going to do this, and mm-hmm. yeah, just the way it fell last minute was was sensational through Edward. But kind of summed up the turgidness of the, the towards the end of that season with with Lennon, where there was a lot of those three 0 nil draws. It was really really scrappy. We basically we kind of stumbled over the line, and then that was kind of leading up to the cup final. Where you're like, we aren't really playing well enough here eh, going into that. Tony, we stumble we stumble across the line in the league. We get the league done. Which was which was great, and it was, it was a bit a massive relief for us, especially yeah. in this this pursuit of the ten at that point. And you thought, are, are we going to kind of make an arse of this really? But we get over the line. But the the results leading up to this cup final against Hearts, um, what was your thoughts going up to this? Because we, we look at the game when Lennon first came in against Hearts, and some would say it was a bit of a struggle. You know, one last minute goal away for a draw, like. It wasn't the Celtic that had been playing under yeah. Brendan Rodgers for a few years. Going into this cup final, though, what was your thoughts? Were you a bit nervous going into this cup final? Just at what was at stake at this point? I think just uh, when Lennon came in, you were seeing sort of games or it was getting to the dying minutes. It was a case of just get the win somehow, just pull us out of the bag somehow. The performance didn't really matter at that point. It was just about staying in the ship with Scott Rossane and getting the three points. Even the game against Kamal, it was seen where Scott Brown won the league at Kelly Park. It was a last minute game that won the game. And that's kind of what I've seen this season as well, where we're getting to this point in games where some killing teams off. But on that cut frame itself, I think also the bigger park at hand in the Celtic notoriously under Rogers was just rampant at Hamden. We were just flinging everyone by the side. So I kinda of feel we had a lot more going through us at hand than going to like the likes of Tain Castle, Kilmar knock for but I thought they were comfortable, and in the end, it did prove to be sort of quite convincing in the two win. Scott, talk about the talk about the game because, like Tony was saying, it was a wee bit nerve wracking. Granted, you're, you're not really sure what to expect for Celtic at this point. And um, you've got the the interim manager, you know, pre kick off interim manager. Um, you're kind of thinking, are we going to slip up here and, and no get this? Um, we go, um, we go a goal down. Uh, in this game, at that point, what were you? What was your overriding feeling towards this Celtic team and Lennon and this potential treble treble? Oh, well, when we went one 0 down, you, you were obviously feeling the worst. I mean, it was kind of symptomatic of a lot of performances that we're getting under Lennon. Where first half nothing really happens. You, you go in at half time and you're not raging because you're not getting dominated, but you're not doing much either. And I felt that at half time, yeah. and then start of the second half, Hearts get the goal. And you are thinking, right, is, is our luck finally about to run out? Is this run going to come at the end? And it's just one more game that we needed for this for this treble treble. And yeah, that time you were, you were. You obviously you are fearing the worst. But obviously then we get the penalty. Uh, personally, I thought it was a wee bit soft, actually, the penalty. But it, it was so given. Red card. Red card. <laughs> <laughs> it was given. And uh, there's no no cooler man in the stadium than, than Odds and Edward. And especially, I loved his interview afterwards because it's the first time we'd ever really actually heard Edward kind of speak and obviously he's trying to get to grips with the language and just the way he's like I had no doubts and I was taking the penalty I knew I was going to score and so Lal actually nearly gets it but uh, yeah the way he slots it away and then at that point you're just thinking right come on just somehow get this done and it was kind of similar it wasn't a similar feeling to the first treble because I don't think we played as well in this game and in fact it was a really really turgid performance if we're, if we're being honest but uh, getting over, obviously, then the second goal, uh, which Edward gets as well, it was a lot of great memory for Lustig. Uh, he puts the header through, and it was obviously his last game, and there was no man you wanted to fall to than Edward, and when he puts that in the, end, in the net, and then the last 10 minutes are just just amazing, and it's probably one of the best feelings I've had in a stadium for about half an hour until the, 
Peter Law will ruin it. So we also we won the game. We we do the this historic table treble, you know, that has been it was spoken about all season. You know, we had a an up and down season, like I say. Um it could have easily it wrong, but we finally get it over the line, Tony. Uh looks like ball through to Edward. After that it's quite it's quite calm. Did you at this point I, I know Scott was saying that they basically ruined it half an hour later by announcing yeah. announcing Lennon. Um did that take the shine off of it for you at that point? Because we know that Lennon wasn't everybody's number one choice, but did, were you able to kind of see past that for, for even 24 hours, or did it kind of sour the, sour the day for you a little bit? Absolutely not. Ruined the day entirely for me. Um, after the game, we had that sort of big bus parade tour booked uh, up the sort of press at the centre of Glasgow. And the overall, overall sort of feeling around about was just everyone going, I can't wait to appoint him. They've actually ruined us. They couldn't give us one day of happiness. Because we, we knew Lennon was still happy at that point. And the next season itself was successful. Yeah, definitely. A great European run. But that year, we just thought, just get us to the end of the season. Do us a favour and we can recruit somebody else in the summer. They give me a fresh idea. Because after Ryan Rogers, the stock is just up there now. We, go, well, we don't want to go back down here. We, we're, we, we, we want top caliber manager. But for me, it was definitely ruined. Um, Peter Lawler himself changed the whole idea of the recruitment policy that day and on his head be it because right now we're seeing it as he's not, good, not doing well enough but we'll, for me it definitely did ruin it 100% We'll go on to talking about, about this current season uh, as well when we kind of lead up to this next game but after that Lennon gets his kind of first full, full season um, since being back I say full season, it got curtailed, obviously, to, towards the end. But as he's the first one that he started um, since coming back, we we don't have the best season. We're not playing the best football. You know, we had the game at Ibrooks that we that we won, um, which was great. That was kind of out of the ordinary for the games we've been playing that season. You know, nothing had been very convincing, but we were grinding out results and it was the whole um, performance of champions. You know, that's what champions do. They grind out results even when it's not going very well. Um, we get a better Fed Cup final game against Rangers. I think we'll all admit that game, we got absolutely battered for for the entire game. Uh, we, we, snuck the, we snuck the win. Probably should have snuck a 2-0. I don't know how you can sneak a 2-0, but Mikey Johnson's one would have made us sneak a 2-0 victory um, yeah. in this game. But I'll come to you, Scott, with, with this season, because obviously we've got that one. We, we have the Scottish Cup final coming up as well at the end of the season, and then it gets curtailed. Um, Rangers had their, their second downfall after coming back from Dubai in January as well. Um, it was very tight at New Year. Um, they have another downfall when they come back. We kind of push on from there. I think we all kind of knew that the season was probably going to go our favour if it had been um, if it hadn't been curtailed and it went to the very end. But was there any kind of fear for you that season, kind of towards the end, that you know we might be a bit sticky here? You know, we might get we might get stuck. Coming up for this this cup final, uh, I think actually looking back on on the season as a whole, I think the football was actually quite good and quite exciting, uh, especially against the sort of middle road SPFL clubs and the form actually that we showed for January to March was some of the best football that I've seen Celtic play in my time watching us, and that is weird. Lennon, I know he's he's the constant guy that always makes excuses and never actually takes responsibility, but that's where I have got some sort of sympathy with him with the season being curtailed, then coming back, it kind of halted our momentum at that point. And I do think when we went to that game at Ibrox, we, we were going to win it just with the form that we were in. But yeah, there was signs in that season, bigger games. I mean, Europe, uh, Europe. there was positives in the group stages a whole, the Lazio games, but there's games like Kluge, Copenhagen, where Neil Lennon's in-game management and just some of the decision he makes, like McGregor at left back, and even seen it this season, Ferenc Varos, Christie up front. And just day games, as I've said before, turning into basketball games and just no sort of control of it. So that was always the worrying sign. And that was why me and Tony were so disappointed that day, the cup final, when they appointed him. Because, yeah, just games, just the big games where you need we, we need a coach. We know we've got, we think we've got the best players in Scotland. Uh, and what we need is a manager in these big games to get us over the line. And that is where we've been lacking. Anytime a team is sort of close to us or just a wee bit below us, we always seem to come up short. And for me, that kind of falls on to the manager. But obviously, the positives of the season, that we've done the nine in a row, we got it through, we got the League Cup somehow. And now, hopefully tomorrow, 
we'll get through and we'll get this get this quadruple treble. Tony, obviously the Scottish Cup then from from last season has to be moved um, into this season to to get it finished. You know, we've got the game against Aberdeen to to get to the final. Um, yeah. Looking looking at form this season, everybody knows we've been mince this season, right? We've been terrible to watch. I mean, we've been terrible. Um, we've been terrible to watch. The performances haven't been haven't been very good. We're obviously sitting. I don't know how many points as we're behind Rangers. It's seven best case scenarios we win the games in hand. Um, we're not playing very well. Would you have rather this game came at the end of last season, or do you think it doesn't really matter when we played this game? We're always going to be up for a cup final. It's frustrating that also this game's getting played from last season to now. Um, it's a tough one because you really want to see Celtic win this, but it doesn't really affect the season at all because this season's not been good enough. But to get a Scottish Cup win, people going, I have got a first trophy, but it's last year's trophy getting played now, so it doesn't really make up for the sins of this year. I think if we win on Sunday, all it does is get all down the road a bit further in New Lennon. It will give them to Ibrox, give them that sort of leeway, and get the fans off his back. But for me, it is a must win. After Rangers dropping a uh, drop points, getting kicked out of the Cup by six, it's a good confidence boost, and hopefully it gives us the the drive we need to actually kick on in the season and give Rangers a bit looking over the shoulder, give them two things to think about. Scott? Can I just interject with some news right now? Because I'm just looking at my phone. Don't want to we don't have some breaking news. It's only 40 minutes, but it's 1-0 uh, to Mullerwell. <clears throat> Ibrox, so this could be the start. Of, this could, I always I get a wee feeling that things are starting to change. Just noticed that if you actually been in a school that I work well, in, and, uh, some of the people are getting really excited. The change of us bringing Turnbull and Sorrow in, and we've had a good couple of weeks, and hopefully tomorrow... It's going to be a massive confidence booster for us if we can win that cup. What happened to them on Wednesday night? Well, obviously, a long way to go in this game, but they're, they're currently 1-0 down. Well, Ryan, this is what you said in the podcast during the week, that you can see the performance start to get on, and they will tire themselves out. Well, I, that's what I said on so I said on our podcast, which we put out this week, um, and the kind of lead up to, to obviously, this coming up. Um, where I, I thought, you know, Celtic winning two games in a row um, for the first time since the start of October... Um, Rangers game against Dundee United you know that, this was kind of in between but their game against Dundee United wasn't very good you know they grinded it out fine we've said time and time again that um, you know champions do that champions grind out results and that's what they were kind of doing against Dundee United but then they went on to St Mirren midweek and they, they get put out of the cup against St Mirren and now it's Scott it's saying and now it's Scott saying it's 1-0 you know like we say it's 40 minutes gone just now um, Motherwell are currently one 0 up at Ibrooks. Um, Callum Lang scored after six minutes, so it's quite early on that they've, they've conceded that goal and not really done much um, by all accounts in the first half. Um, I can you see don't that too, too quick, with it, but they do no. they do tend to sort of cave in under pressure. They're, they're cruising at the top. But that's when they usually do bottle it. Well, but for Scott, me, I don't see it happen this season. I really don't. But Scott, what is it you missed. said? What is it you said, Scott, about about Rangers you, on the podcast? You said they're they're due a blip, and I think you said in the group chat as well about them um, kind of keeping up this momentum. Yeah, I I think I just been seen the last couple of games. I think they are due a blip, and they run they run like butchers' dogs. Like see when I'm watching them, and I'm think I think there's no coincidence that they've kind of gassed themselves out come January in the previous two seasons, and maybe it's happening a wee bit earlier now. And he's got a wee bit of a stronger squad, Gerard, to call on, but obviously. I don't want to talk about too much about them because it's a Celtic podcast at the end of the day. No, no, no. I, I, it's, I think, more, uh, it's more for what we're going to talk about, though, kind of towards the end. Tomorrow, it's... it'd be a defining weekend this year. So obviously, we're not playing in the league. And my worry was, oh, here we go, it's another. My feelings towards a cup final, they've sort of changed in the last couple couple of days, to be honest, because before I thought it was thought it was a distraction and everything that happened with the protests against the board. And were like, the only reason I know Sack Neil Lennon is because they want him to win his treble so he can be the guy that's done it as a player, done it as a manager. But now it's and it's sort of seemed to be a distraction. I thought, here we go. It's going to be three games in hand now, further points behind in the league. I mean, we'll see what happens with this game. But now I'm thinking it could be a real definer for us. It gives the guys like Turnbull, Sorrow, eh, Connor Hazard, guys that haven't won anything with us, just a sort of taste of taste of success and a winning trophies breeds confidence, and it can it can really hopefully kick start us. And it could be it could be a massive moment in this. And obviously, it's, it's a good chance to mark the quadruple treble, look back on it. But the Ram case for this season, the kick on that we could hopefully get for this game, it could be just huge. So what are you saying, Scott? Are you saying Peter Lawwell on the board are right to keep Neil Lennon on, and you are wrong? 
Absolutely fucking not, no. I mean, if, if we got that anyway, <laughs> then we'd like to bend out. We've, we've made that 50 50 call, yeah. <laughs> I think uh, I made the point before, though, like on, on our podcast, I, I've been on record of saying that the, the league is done for me. This was three weeks ago. Um, I said if we turn this round and we win the league this season, I said if we turn this round and I win and, and we win the league, I said I will I will eat a hat live on camera. I will take a full hat and I'll munch it. And you know what? I'm actually bricking myself now that I might need to do it because I'm starting to doubt what I said. You know, I should I should never do it. I should never commit to something like that so early. <laughs> but, I want a big fedora or something. something I'm, huge. <laughs> a big massive fedora. A sombrero of that side, mate. It's just trying to Aye. match a sombrero. Uh, right, boys, we'll talk about this this game uh, tomorrow. So, quadruple treble against Hearts. We've been talking about kind of players coming in and players not coming in uh, over the last few weeks on, on our podcast. Um, we were all chomping a bit to see guys at like Turnbull, uh, Sorrow get a chance. I think we were in a group chat a couple of weeks ago. Um, when I think we were playing a European game or it was a league game and we had two goalies on the bench and I think it was a Milan game and Barkas had let in something with two goalies on the bench and I, I said to you chuck it in Hazard just do it because I, I want to see him I think he's going to have the easiest kind of not easiest job but nobody's going to expect too much from him which might take the the kind of pressure off him a little bit to perform uh, Barkas come with £5 million kind of price tag to live up to Scott Bain lost his place got it back lost his place got it back so he's kind of got a bit of pressure to keep it Hazard might have been the kind of best option I'll go with you does Hazard Scott does he start in this cup final for you? Yeah, I, absolutely for me. Uh, I think if I mean the other two goals. I mean, it, when Barkas was originally dropped, I felt I felt it was kind of good for him because we were only performing and he was getting no real protection for back four and middle to front. And I thought it was good that he sort of been out of the team and, and Bain sort of been the fall guy. Bain he's hopeless as well. He he was hopeless, but then Barkas came in. I mean, it's no work for him. He's, he's, he's basically no saved a shot. So and Hazard, Barkas, me just couldn't see a word document, man. <laughs> he basically uh, Hazard just looks a bit more commanding. He's six foot six. Uh, he just looks kind of. He's obviously not had a lot to do in the two games previously, but I think with Julian and Duffy, it's a bit more solid in front and sorrow, and that has get left a bit like better protection for the goal. But I think Barkas looks a bit nervous. He's not very vocal. Uh, even when balls get played over the top, he seems to be like stuck on his line for me. And even I'm like, get out of get out of your box and just pick the ball up. Like it just seems dead nervous. And I think. I think if we go with Hazard, uh, we need to just, I've said it before on our podcast, that if we do go with him, we need to stick with him. If we're going to pick this goalie, we need to, we can't. If he makes a mistake, then flip it back to Barkas the next game. We need to now make a decision, stick with him. I still think we need to recruit a goalie in January, but for now we've got these three guys in. And for me, yep, Hazard, start him tomorrow and then stick with him right through. Tony, do you agree with that? Would you go with Hazard? Yeah, I think he's both hit the nail on the head, definitely. I think... <sighs> The young boy, he's not really had much to do, but what he's had to do, he's been called upon, he's, and he's been reliable enough. Um, the goal against, the team away goal, Leo scored, he couldn't actually ask him to do much more than that. It was a great, great finish from the boy. So, I, for me, you go Hazard, and you see what happens to him. Like, he's a big, lumpy boy. He seems to be quite commanding in the box. He's marshalling the defence a little bit as well. So, I have no qualms about it. Put Hazard in and see what he's got. Tony, I'll stick with you then for this one. Uh, after the game at the weekend, um, when Turnbull and, and Soro both played quite well, played quite well in two games in a row now, um, Neil Lennon was asked about whether they've kind of put themselves in contention for this game. Uh, and he came out with the, the classic line, you know, I'll, I'll get people in who got us there, you know, reward people who the got us there. Core. It was a bit of a, a kind of sentimentality type thing from him. However, that being said, he was asked about it again this week and did come out and say there's no room for sentimentality. So he's kind of went back on what he said. Do you think that he's going to go with the old guard of Scott Brown for this one? Like we've, For people who don't listen to our podcast, we've made it very clear that we don't think Scott Brown should be playing every single game. We've been on record by saying that. He has a place in the squad as this, this kind of leading figure. He's got a place to come on to games, I think, just now. But the guy's 35, and he's keeping some David Turnbull out of the team. I don't know what his Turnbull is off the top of my head. Um, but young guy out of the team. Turnbull and Sorrow get their chance, Tony. Do they stick in this team for you? For me, they definitely stick in that team. I think Sorrow and Turnbull have been a breath, breath of fresh air in, in the team. Turnbull's done recently in the box from corners and set pieces. It's been remarkable difference from Ryan Christie's. I think Ryan Christie is a great player on the day, but he just looks to just hit the ball and see where it lands. But with Turnbull, it's placed on a plate. Even Duffy's got the second goal. It was a complete bullet header, and it was just on a plate from him. It's like 
get up, get the net muscles on that Duffy, and it'll be in the back of the net. But I can honestly see Neil Lennon playing Scott Brown tomorrow. I have no doubt in my mind that that's what he's going to do because, well, it's his boy, isn't it? What about you, Scott? Do you, do you agree? Is he going to go back to Scott Brown or do you think he's, do you think he's listened? Because obviously he said he's going to go with the players who got him there um, and then he somehow has kind of changed his mind through press conferences through the week. Um, do you think he's going to kind of change his mind with this one and go with the, the young guys? Uh, I'm maybe being quite naive to say this, but I do think that he's going to pick, he's going to go with Sorrow uh, and Turnbull. I just think Neil Lennon is under huge pressure in this match. He's still, even though we've won the last couple of games, still under massive pressure to win this this game tomorrow. Uh, and if it doesn't go as right, we'll be under even more pressure. I just think if he picks Scott Brown, he's given fans a sort of excuse in a way in terms of we are now calling for Sorrow and Turnbull. You've got to go with these guys. Why? Why the hell would you change a sort of winning team in the last two games? What Neil Lennon says uh, in his press rooms, I try and take a pinch of salt because he's kind of making it up as he goes along. I think half the time he says one thing, next week contradicts himself. I mean, he yeah. says players want to be here and then two days later he's saying, oh, these guys are brilliant. And he's always, I do view his press conferences, which isn't good for my mental health because it just gets me riled. But uh, <laughs> try and actually take these things that he says with a pinch of salt. I think tomorrow, I've, maybe as I say, naive to say it, but I think he is going to go. Uh, with Sorrow and Turnfoot and I hope I'm right and I think whatever team he picks at, at quarter past one when the teams will come out an hour before kick-off is going to tell us exactly how this game goes but on, on the just the kind of debate about it I think I feel sorry for Scott Brown I don't feel like this is an, an attack on Scott Brown that people have got Scott Brown's 35 and he's been absolutely amazing for us but a 35 year old same way like Man United with Paul Scholes like, we didn't play him week in week out that Lennon seems to do so I think the fans are kind of on Scott Brown's side in that regard, that it's not fair on him, that's what's been happening. And I say, no. but on this game, like with Hearts, I think whether we play Scott Brown or not, we should be beating Hearts, and it shouldn't really flip on this decision. But I think the way the game might go, we'll, we'll flip on this decision. If we play Sorrow and Turnbull, I expect us to win quite handsomely, 2 or 3 now. Play Scott Brown, it could end up being a total slog, like games have been all season. We spoke about the the strike force as well on our podcast this this week um, when we kind of had our predictions for this game. Um, naturally, Scott, me and you went for Odson Edward up front. Tony, you went with a bit of a curveball this week, didn't you? To be honest, you, I want Clamal up top. What do you think Clamal is going to? I'm not going to say what he's going to bring because we know what Clamal can do. But why? Let's get rocking. Why? <laughs> why in a game like this would you throw somebody like Clamal in over somebody like Edward, who is? Performed, you know, he, he's performed so much over the years, especially at Hamden. Um, yeah. What is it about this game you're thinking, do you know what, no, I'm going to go with Clamalla? Well, to be honest, Edward this season really hasn't kicked his ass for me at all. Um, the games he's been a part of, he's walking about the park, he's jogging, he's not tracking down his runners, he's not putting pressure on defence. The Clamalla, you seen it against, uh, was it Leo? He came on, was he mm-hmm. started against Leo? Aye. Anyway, the, he was pressing defence, he was making the unselfish run, he was allowing players to get in and around the fox by just doing that unselfish run, taking him out, dragging the defender with him. For me, Kamala is a no-brainer start. He's the only player that seems to be putting effort in and training. He shared his heat, which I'm all for. Yep, exactly right. <laughs> um, but for me, Kamala is definitely the starter. Edward himself doesn't look really that bothered. I know we have Charlie Nicholas a hard time saying that oh, Edward doesn't look arse, but this season, it just looks like Edward is just playing just for a move. He doesn't want, he's chucked the toys at the pram. He doesn't want to be here, it looks. But if you don't start Kamala, I want Griffiths in. Simple as that. Scott, it's a bold, it's a bold call, isn't it, for, for Tony there to, to ditch a guy like Odds and Edward. I can kind of see where he's coming from um, in the sense that Edward hasn't kicked his ass this season. You know, he's, he's not been on form. Um, other guys might give us a bit more. For me, and I think you'll probably agree with me when I say this, you don't leave somebody like Edward out a big cup final, so. Oh no, absolutely not. I would, I would definitely still go, go with Odds and Edward tomorrow. I think the COVID things probably impacted Edward as well, which needs to be taken into. I think uh, he was out for a couple of weeks, and then obviously the follow up for that is in terms of maybe it takes him a wee bit while we got up to speed. But I think that he's played in flashes this season. I do get what Tony's saying. I think at times he is sort of playing for himself, uh, even in terms of the the AC Milan game, like when Edward gets his wee dink over the goal, he gets his goal, that's his headline. He can then sell that and try and get his move from then. And it is going to come to a point where we are going to sell him, whether it's January, whether it's at the end of the season. But I think these are the headline games and 
that Edward he had def- he was a hero for his last time, and and I think you've just you've just got to go to him. I think I would try and imagine it from the position of they've got Christoph Berra and is it the guy Halkett at the back, and I'm thinking right, I'm day two. Who do I want to go up against here? Patrick Kamala. I think Kamala's been really good for us. He's Tony says he's putting a lot of effort, and I think Kamala's still lacking a wee bit of confidence in that final third. Uh, he's not scored as many goals as maybe we'd hoped that he would get and I think he's a player that could come on in this game he's going to give us his options in terms of running in behind but I'm thinking who's better and how could want to play if they see Kamala coming out they'll be thinking yes we're in for a wee bit of an easier ride today they see Edward they're going to have the fear for him because what he's done to him last year well I think in the recent weeks though Kamala's proven that he's a second choice striker by getting the summer appearances over Ayeti and Griffiths uh, but you see with Clamalla, he gets the run in behind the defenders against St Johnston. It was a great strike he took. Um, and I think that would be absolutely deadly in the cup final. I think the bigger part would suit us getting in behind them a lot easier. I, I agree with that, Tony. I agree this game probably has got a, a place for something like Kamala. I reckon, like Scott says, he's kind of lacking confidence in that final third of scoring goals. But taking your point as well about him, he's kind of, his pace, getting in behind people and stuff, I reckon he could probably, you know, gay. Guys that better the shitters, to be honest, with you, you know, running in behind him and, and making him backtracking, etc. Um, so no, I, I would go with I would go with Edward personally. Um, but I do I do agree with you that Clamella has got a point to a part to play in this. I would like to see Griffiths as well, just for the hearts thing, but that's purely that's purely just because it's Griffiths against Hearts in it. That's the only reason. Um right, I'll get we've got five minutes left in, boys, or four minutes left now. I'll get predictions from you. So Scott, I'll start with you. Just now, what's your prediction for this game? How do you see it going? As I say, I think it all depends on what team he announces before kickoff eh, and how this will go. I'm quite confident, though, that that we will we will do this tomorrow. Eh, we think we've had a kick on in confidence the last couple of weeks with a full week of training. If Neil Lennon actually does any training, eh, but four, day, like, four days off. Four days off. Probably four, four days off, but eh, hopefully a full week building up to. Hamden, I mean, it was a place that had horrible memories, actually, for me. Hamden, pre-Rogers coming in in terms of dialing, even Lennon's first spell, we used to lose. We've lost, I've seen us lose to Hearts in that place. Uh, but I think tomorrow, I'm quietly confident of a, of a 2-0 victory. And I think uh, David Turnbull and probably a player of the season so far, uh, Moyo Mo- Yunusi, will get the goal. That's my prediction. I thought going to say Soro. <laughs> <laughs> no, Soro, Soro, uh, snap Andy Halliday. And get sent off in the 90th minute when the game's done anyway. That is a cup final for me. That's the trophy right there. That's fine. I'll take that. That'd be done. That'd be done. Tony, your prediction. Go for it. What have you got? Uh, well, Hearts are playing not too bad so far. He's on top of the championship there and came off a good win at the weekend. But for me, I'm going to go 3 0. 3 0. I think it'll be quite a comfortable victory in the end. I really mm-hmm. do. I agree with you, mate. I'm, I'm going to go for 3 0 as well. I think it's one of these ones. I think Hearts have got. We need to be careful with, with Hearts because they've got guys, and I know we, we talk about it, you've got guys like Naismith, you've got guys like Halliday, guys like Craig Gordon there just now, guys that are out to prove something against us. Um, not for saying for a second that I think that they that they can or will. You know, I think we should definitely have enough to deal with them, but there's always that kind of wee factor, especially with Celtic this season, that I think that we just need to be careful. Are these guys popping up and catching us out? I think everybody has to have their game their game heads on, they need to be ready for it at all times. Um, and Hopefully, we'll be sitting here on Monday morning, hung over with a, a quadruple treble in the bag. So, boys, I'll, I'll round this off just now. Thank you very much for, for taking the part, um, to be a part of this. It's a Celtic state of mind. Um, Paul John Dykes put this together. It's a quadruple treble charity weekender. Like I said at the start, we're raising money for four great charities. We've got Rock Talk. Uh, who you'll see a wee video from us there at the start. They use football as a starting point to talk about mental health. Uh, the Food Fast... Food Fact, sorry, Friends Food Bank. Uh, we've got Children's First, which is Scotland's national children's charity and help for the homeless as well. So the full details, they'll be below us on this if you want to go on to Twitter. I see the State of Mind's Twitter account. They've got the links to the GoFundMe page, etc. across there as well. Like I said at the start, give a little, go a long way just now, especially for people that are a bit less fortunate than, than us. We've been Pod67. Get us on Twitter at pod underscore 1967. We do this every single week. We talk about the games every Sunday. Put a podcast out on the Monday. Um, just giving our thoughts on on the week uh, for Celtic as well. So, Tony, mate, thank you very much for taking part. Thanks for having us, guys. God bless. And Scott, cheers, mate. Uh, thanks for having us. I'm away to sit in a darting room, put my phone on at five o'clock, and hopefully Motherwell have done the business. <laughs> <laughs> right, cheers, guys.